Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm a scientist, not an artist, and uh, I often sort of do talks like this, and I like to just do them off the top of my head. I don't like to prepare them too much. And if you want to ask me any questions as we go along, feel free. I'm happy to. So what I thought I'd do is I thought I'd describe you a little bit uh, about the nature of human memory, how it works in the brain about a particular form of memory that I speak, because there are many different forms of memory. People just think memory is one thing, but in fact it isn't. Uh, <coughs> a distinction is often made, actually, between procedural memory, that's memory for routines and actions, very important in sport, for example, and declarative memory, which is memory for facts, and in particular for memory for the events of our lives, which is termed autobiographical memory, and that's one of the areas that I'm uh, well known for studying. And I thought it might be quite useful to get a handle on this is to, for me to describe to you how memory comes into being in the brain, and how you bring one to mind. And then a little bit about brain injury and what happens when it all goes wrong. And in the course of that, we'll, you'll see we're covering things which are related to interlocking zones, if you want. Let's uh, turn to recalling a memory. So one uh, technique we sometimes use when we're studying people's memories is we get them to recall memories to cue words. So we give them a word. Here's one for you guys. Uh, restaurant. Uh, you should be able to bring a memory to mind to that if you try hard. <coughs> you don't have to tell me, so we'll do an experiment. Now, we can do that and we can put someone in a scanner, an fMRI scanner, and have them bring words, uh, memories to mind to phrases and words which we carefully constructed. And so then we can map what's going on in their brains. Now, a common metaphor for memory is that memory is like a video, or perhaps it's like a series of photographs, perhaps it's like a book on the shelf in a library. But in fact, it's none of those things. So when you start to retrieve a memory, you start to get activation in the front part of the brain called the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are where the executive processes are. And what they do is they start elaborating your cues. You think, restaurant, when did I go to a restaurant last? Well, I went last week, didn't I? And you're elaborating your cue and you're probing knowledge which is stored in the posterior part of the brain, particularly in an area called the occipital lobes. And these are the areas uh, which are the primary visual processing areas and which partly store mental images, and particularly mental images of the past. So when I recall this uh, restaurant that I went to, uh, I remember it was in a little wine bar in my hometown of Dieton called uh, Suvios. I have an image of the French chef Paul who runs it. He's a very old man, but he's a fantastic chef, and so his, his image comes to my mind. Probably you have similar images coming to your mind when you do this rather uh, facile task of bringing memory to mind to work. So, what happens now? Okay, all this is taking place in real time. Activation is building in the frontal lobes here. Networks at the back of you are being probed. There's a crucial area kind of on the base of your brain towards the middle called the hippocampus. Uh, the hippocampus uh, is essential for forming memories. Uh, it's called the hippocampus because the 19th century neurosurgeons who first discovered it thought it looked like a seahorse and hippocampus is Latin for sequence. In fact, a lot of structures in the brain are named after objects. So the one that deals with uh, negative emotions, uh, the amygdala, which is attached to the hippocampus, is so-called because it looks like an almond, and the amygdala is Latin for almond. So these patterns of activation are rising and zooming through these incredibly complex networks, right? And as you bring that memory to mind, all of these networks are active, and they're all interlocked, and they're all functioning together. And it's almost as though the brain sort of breathes a memory. It's not as though any one single little part of it lights up and says, oh, this is my restaurant memory from last week. It's not like that. And of course, will we bring a memory to mind? Uh, an interesting question is, what do we have in mind? Clearly, uh, every memory is time compressed with respect to the event it represents. Uh, and in the modern view of human memory, uh, we know that the information you bring to mind is actually quite far removed from your experience of an event. Usually just a few fragments, often in the form of visual images. Most studies that have looked at this have found that about, when you're remembering events from the past, about 80% of what you remember is in the form of visual images. And indeed, if you suffer brain damage to a part of the occipital lobes, uh, obviously you'll have disturbed vision, 
uh, but you'll also become amnesic as a secondary consequence. So you'll be able to remember things about your life, but you won't be able to have the imagery that goes with them and brings them to life and gives them what William James called uh, their warmth. And in fact, amnesic patients who can no longer remember the past are retaught a lot of their memories by uh, their carers, usually their parents. Uh, if you ask them, can you remember this event, they can give you an account. And so what does it feel like? Does it feel like a memory? And they say no. And actually, they use that word, it doesn't have any warmth. So when we bring a memory to mind, it's not just information that's coming to mind, there are lots of feelings that are happening as well. Uh, some of those feelings are fairly, fairly obvious ones related to the content of the memory, but some of them are more subtle, such as does it have this warmth to it? Did it come to mind with a certain flow, easily? We often think if we bring things to mind easily, with a lot of cognitive effort, that they're more vivid. And people often rate their memories as being more vivid if they come to mind without a great deal of effort, with what I think you would be calling flow. OK, well, so it, the process of bringing a memory to mind is, is complicated. and. Uh, we have lots of different sorts of knowledge about our lives, some of it more abstract, some of it much more event-related. So I remember I went to uh, a school that no longer exists, St Mary's Grammar School. All right? uh, but I don't remember really much in the way of events about that. And indeed, as we get older and our memories age, we tend to lose these perceptual details, although we may still retain the conceptual knowledge of events and experiences that we've had. Uh, <coughs> Let's now sort of move a little bit into uh, the consequences uh, of brain damage uh, and the amnesia that result, because they're quite revealing about the nature of memory. So um, if this area of the brain, the hippocampus, let's say got destroyed, let's say you had a stroke, and a particular venous system subserving the hippocampus there was actually a blockage there, and so the blood flow to the hippocampus was reduced or uh, stopped altogether, the hippocampus would die. So this happened, you would never be able to recreate it. It's the only area of the brain where there's neurogenesis, that is to say where new neurons are generated uh, in, uh, when you're undertaking cognitive activities. Although mysteriously, every cell in the brain is replaced at least three times over a lifetime, making us all wonder, how can it still be the same brain? <laughs> anyway, if the hippocampus goes or it gets damaged, you'll suffer what's called anterograde amnesia. Anterograde amnesia refers to the reduced ability or the inability to form new memories. Okay? Now, people often assume that this isn't like you've lost your short term memory, or they say things like that. You haven't. The whole thing about amnesia patients is that they have intact short term memories. Your short-term memory uh, has a duration of about two minutes. If things don't get from short-term memory into long-term memory, then in all brains, they undergo what we call catastrophic forgetting. Right? You can never, ever remember that event because it never got into long-term memory. Uh, so the anterograde amnesic has great difficulty forming new memories. They still have access to their past memories, often, but usually in a slightly degraded form, but they usually have some access. Uh, and, of course, life for them is completely compromised. If you can't form new memories, you can't find your way around uh, learning new maps, learning new concepts, it's impossible for you. And this, this, this little area, the hippocampus, is absolutely crucial to that type of learning. Uh, another type of amnesia is called retrograde amnesia rather than anterograde amnesia. And retrograde amnesia refers to your inability to recall events prior to your brain damage. And uh, it's very rare. You see, because the long-term knowledge is part of these complicated systems of the, near, you know, the neocortex, which would all have to be compromised to some extent for you to start losing your knowledge of the past. But in fact, in um, temporal lobe amnesia, temporal lobes are kind of in the middle there, behind the frontal lobes and before you get to the uh, <coughs> parietal and occipital lobes, and the hippocampus is part of the temporal lobe system. So uh, pe people with uh, temporal lobe uh, Alzheimer's uh, dementia uh, do eventually lose their, their past. It's quite an unusual thing to happen. I remember talking or interviewing an amnesic patient uh, 
at the French Air Hospital in Bristol. And uh, he had no idea where he'd lived for the past 40 years. He actually lived in, in Edinburgh, and his wife had to remind him. He still could remember it. And, and what happens is people start to lose their memories in chunks like that. Chunks that are meaningful to them. Yeah. So my life in Edinburgh, lost access to it, it's gone. But it's not just losing access. Most of us can't remember things because we lose access. You can't find that cue that's going to let us get at the memory. In uh, these brain damaged uh, patients with dementia, they're actually losing the neural material in which the memories are represented. And so that's another form of catastrophic forgetting. You can never remember those memories because the, the wet way in which they're represented is dead. Uh, and there are lots of other forms of amnesia which are, which are quite interesting. Uh, so, for example, if you suffer damage to the frontal systems, the frontal lobes, uh, very often a, a symptom that emerges is confabulation. And frontal lobe confabulators are really fascinating people because they will uh, tell you some event from their life, right? and everything in it will be true but the memory will be false. So the people who are in it, the places who are in it, they're all you know, places they've been, their actions are all things they've done. They're just configured in a way uh, so they represent an event that never happens. And they themselves cannot distinguish that mental representation uh, from a true memory. And there is interesting questions I might get to get towards ending on this, so I suppose well, not a bit longer, uh, about true and false memories. So in a sense, to go back to what I started out with, all our memories are false. Because they're not representations of experiences we've had, they're something that's been abstracted from that experience. Okay, so even the image you have of this fantastic restaurant with the French chef Paul in it, uh, that's abstracted. It's actually quite abstracted, actually. You ask people about, about, about these things sometimes. So they say they've got a memory of some particular event. And you say, okay, this is the one I've often used with uh, journalists in the media. So uh, I did one recently on the radio program. So the old guy was sort of trying to get a bit clear about things. And so, well, can you uh, recall a recent memory? Anything from the past month or so. And he recalled going to the pub with his friend uh, a week previously. I was trying to illustrate this point of that all memories are false. <clears throat> and I said to him, well, what were you wearing? And he had no idea. And I said, in your memory, presumably you're not naked in the pub. <laughs> your brain has put that in for you that you were clothed. It just hasn't told you what clothes you were wearing. And uh, we get a lot of these unconscious inferences uh, in, in memories when we rec recollect the past. And that's why all memories are simultaneously true and false. Of course, some are completely false. So I realized some time ago that my earliest memory was false. So my earliest memory was uh, an image of me as a baby, sitting outside my parents' house, on the pavement, digging in the cracks between the paving stones with a bit of wood. Uh, and it was only after 50 years that I realised my parents would never have allowed a baby to go and sit out <laughs> on the street outside uh, with only a nappy on. And another lovely false memory, actually, a guy gave to me, I was embarrassed after I was giving a talk. He said he'd remembered during his talk, one of his early memories was when his brother was born. And uh, he'd be really agitated about this. And his father, you know, fathers in those days were not allowed to go to hospitals for their wives. And so his father had been on the phone to the mother who had just given birth. And uh, in between talking to her, he tried to pacify him by talking to him about the moon landings. Because as a little lad, he'd be really you know, excited and obsessed with the moon landings. Uh, and it was only during my talk that he realised that his brother had been born in 1968, one year before the moon landings. <laughs> Uh, yes. Well, this, is, this is fascinating stuff, but doesn't it have massive implications for things like witness statements in courts of law if the most mem all memories are false and abstract? Absolutely. We've done several big reports on that, published papers on it, but uh, a real problem that judges in particular, barristers, will, I don't mind, they'll just play with anything if they can use it for their defence or attack, uh, can't accept the modern view of human memory because it undermines so much in the law. And, me, uh, well, I can't put a figure on it, but many, many cases that go through our courts, the only evidence is somebody's memory. And I often get called as an expert witness, but uh, judges have this view. My view is this we all have memories, uh, therefore, we don't need to ask an expert. 
we can introspect on our memories and know what's true and what isn't. Uh, so all these experiments which have been done in recent years that have shown how malleable memory is are really problematic for them. Shall I tell you a couple of my favourite before I stop The good ones. <laughs> you can't really do them anymore because they're not ethical. But um, so you get a bunch of students together and you say, look, we're really interested in what people can remember you know, from their childhood, from early in life, as early as possible. Can we have your permission to write to your mother and get her to send us a list of events that she thinks you might remember and then we'll test your memory for them? So that's fine. And so you get these things. You actually really do write to the mother, you really do get the list. And then you just insert falsely in the list. Um, the one they usually use is, I went to a wedding and knocked over a chewing of soup. So you say to people, the students, right, okay, can you try and remember these events? It's very difficult to remember in childhood events. Uh, but do your best. See so what you can do. And we don't expect you to get a memory to every single thing. Uh, and if you do that, about 30% of the students remember knocking over chewing of soup to wedding. If you ask them again a week later, it's completely integrated into their memory. They know whose wedding it was, uh, they can name people and tell you who else was there. <laughs> now if you do the same experiment again, and you say, this time, new groups of students. Remembering these things in the past is difficult, so I'm going to give you a technique that's going to help you. When you read the statement, uh, try to bring to mind a visual image. That's all you have to do. It doesn't have to be a memory. Try, you might find that helps you, uh, you know, recall. And if you do that, over 60% of these students end up having a false memory of knocking over a tube in a soup uh, at a uh, wedding. There are lots of other experiments like this, I won't go into them, but the, they illustrate the point. And the point is this, that your memory is constructive. Uh, there's lots of unconscious inference going on. And what you're doing is you're mapping your memories you bring to mind onto the long-term knowledge structures. And we all have false memories, and indeed, all of our memories, as I said earlier, are false to some extent. Uh, 